This is one of a series of Good Answers presentations, offering evidence to answer skeptical challenges to the Bible's accuracy. I recently began reading a novel that looked to be well worthwhile. On the page before the actual text began, I found this statement, quote, This is a work of fiction. Names, characters, places, and incidents either are the product of the author's imagination or are used fictitiously, and any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, events or locales, is entirely coincidental." End quote. We have all seen statements like that, prefacing books we've read. We expect and understand that this is the difference between fiction and nonfiction. No matter how realistic a tale may be, if we see that statement, we will know the rules of the game. Enjoy the ride, but don't get the idea that what you're reading is history. Unfortunately, there are those today who treat the Bible as if it had such a disclaimer on its opening pages. And as a result, they read it, if they do at all, as they would a novel by Nora Roberts or Clive Cussler. But even though the most recent part of the Bible, the New Testament, is some 2,000 years old, its narrative portions are solid history, and the people who line its pages are quite real. Archaeology has brought up direct evidence that they belong to history, not to artistic fiction. In this talk, we'll see a number of them. We may begin with Herod the Great. He looms large in the narrative of Jesus' birth, as the king who tried to use the wise men to locate the infant Jesus, and as the one who ordered the massacre of infants in Bethlehem. Backed by the might of Rome, Herod had ruled Palestine for decades, and his greed and cruelty had made him soundly hated by all. When death finally took him, an elaborate funeral cortege brought his body to one of the fortresses south of Jerusalem, the Herodium, and there he was buried. Here's the Herodium. Seen from this angle, it just looks like a rather nicely shaped hill. But in an aerial view, elements of the fortress are easy to pick out. A reconstruction drawing, though, always helps the non-specialists among us. And in this case, it tells us a bit about this king. The floor plan included a colonnaded courtyard, a trademark Greek feature. A synagogue, even though Herod was anything but an observant Jew. And a bath complex, something in which a Roman would feel right at home. Herod was an admirer of Greek culture, but he ruled over a Jewish nation. And he ruled only because Caesar had put him on the throne. If we had had no literary records about him, this fortress plan alone would have told us quite a bit. And there was more to it. A monumental staircase led down to another palace at the foot of the hill, plus an enormous complex that included pool facilities. The Herodium. That's where Josephus' history tells us Herod was buried. But where, exactly? For 35 years, Echud Netzer, professor of Hebrew University, searched for the tomb. And finally, in 2007, he found it. Here is the king's sarcophagus. If we wonder why it is so thoroughly shattered, well, that's what his subjects thought of him. Almost as soon as the retinue had departed, the people took their revenge on him. Nobody doubts that Herod the Great existed. He's there on the pages of the New Testament and of Josephus, and in remains of his many building projects. But even if we had nothing like the Herodium to point to, we'd still have 
physical evidence like this coin. Since it was minted during his reign, it bears his name, here in Greek, Basileos, of the king, and Herodu, Herod. My own doctorate is in classics, the Greek and Latin languages, plus their literature, culture, and history. But I specialized in inscriptions. An ancient object that is inscribed lets us almost touch persons who are long dead and reminds us that they were real. Let's find some more of these. Everyone who knows the story of Jesus knows of Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor who sentenced him to be executed. And yet, though he was a Roman official, he goes almost unmentioned by the historians of that period. Caesar, Cicero, Pompey, and Mark Antony were the movers and shakers of the time, while Judea was a backwater province to be governed by third-string politicians. So it was of some importance when, in 1961, archaeologists uncovering the remains of a Roman theater in Caesarea found a dedicatory inscription. It's broken, but still legible. The theater was dedicated to Tiberius Caesar, named here, and it was dedicated during the term of Pontius Pilatus, who was Praefectus Judaei, governor of Judea. Another major figure in the trial of Jesus was Joseph Caiaphas, high priest. Matthew tells us this about him. Quote, then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas and they plotted to arrest Jesus in some sly way and kill him. Despite the Bible's account, many scholars in the 18th and 19th centuries had questioned whether Caiaphas even existed. Then, in 1990, workmen were preparing a new park for Jerusalem when they came upon a burial cave. All work had to stop, of course, until experts could come in and evaluate its contents. There were some dozen ossuaries in the cave. Ossuary. That's a term we don't hear often. It is a box, usually limestone, made to contain the bones of the dead, and it reflects a practice employed by the Jews for just about a century, from 20 B.C. to A.D. 70. Rabbinic tradition tells us about the ritual. Quote, Rabbi Eliezer Bar Tzadok said, Thus spoke father at the time of his death, My son, bury me first in a grave. In the course of time, collect my bones and put them in an ossuary, but do not gather them with your own hands. And thus did I watch him. Yohanan entered, collected the bones, and spread a sheet over them. I then came in, rent my clothes for them, and sprinkled dry herbs over them. Just as he attended his father, so I attended him. One ossuary in this tomb held the bones of six individuals. There were four children, one adult woman, and one man, judged to be about 60 years of age. This ossuary was handsomely decorated, as you see here, no doubt by a professional. And on this end of it, a relative had inscribed the name, Yehosef Bar Kayafa, or as we would say, Joseph, son of Caiaphas. Could this be the high priest of scripture? The Jewish historian Josephus clarifies it for us. When he refers to the high priest of this time, he terms him, quote, Joseph, who was called Caiaphas. That is, his name was Joseph, but he was called by his father's name. So here is that priest who had Jesus arrested, 
declared him guilty of blasphemy and handed him over to Pilate for sentencing. There was, as you may know, a whole family of Herods who ruled various portions of Israel for three generations. This one is Herod Agrippa II, whose tenure was from A.D. 50 to 93. We remember him for the time when Paul, in chains, finally had the opportunity to preach to a Herod. Quote, the next day Agrippa and Berenica came with great pomp and entered the audience room with his ranking officers and the leading men of the city. At the command of Festus, Paul was brought in. Festus said, King Agrippa and all who are present with us, you see this man. And after hearing Paul, the king said, this man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Acts 26, 32. Well, Agrippa, as many rulers do, had coins struck during his reign, like this one. Across the center of it, we see Alpha, Gamma, Rho, Iota, Pi, Pi. The coin was struck a little off center, so it's missing the final letter, Alpha. And on the right, above his name, his title is noted, Beta Alpha, an abbreviation for Basileos, King. Another character from the New Testament who turns out to be a real king. You may recall this man, Lucius Sergius Paulus, governor of the island of Cyprus, A.D. 47 and 48. On their first missionary journey, Paul and Barnabas encountered him, as we read in Acts 13. Quote, there they met a Jewish sorcerer and a false prophet named bar who was an attendant of the proconsul, Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elamus the sorcerer opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Immediately mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. Here's an inscription mentioning him. We see L. Sergius. Uh, the Romans used only about 35 first names, so L was enough to indicate Lucius. And above there is his cognomen, or family name, Paulus. Pauli in the genitive case. Now the inscription was not found on Cyprus. Paulus was governor there only two years. But in Yalvat, Turkey. Hmm. Why there? Well, that's near the city of Antioch of Pisidia from apostolic days. And we know from other sources that the family of the Sergii Pauli had large estates there. Now, we've just read that Sergius Paulus was converted to Christ through Paul's testimony. Perhaps at that time, Sergius Paulus asked Paul to travel to Pisidian Antioch to speak to other members of his extended family that resided there maybe even giving him a letter of introduction. And if so, Paul would have a special reason for visiting that city, as Acts tells us he did. In fact, we're told of nothing Paul did in Italia and Perga, going instead up to Antioch of Pisidia. Suddenly, an inscription brings Sergius Paulus to life for us, a new believer concerned for his family. Now, Lucius Junius Gallio governed a portion of Greece in A.D. 52 and 3, the time when Paul visited Corinth. Remember this passage? 
While Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him into court. This man, they charged, is persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. Just as Paul was about to speak, Gallio said to the Jews, If you Jews are making a complaint about some misdemeanor or serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since it involves questions about words and names in your own law, settle the matter yourselves. I will not be a judge of such things. So he had them ejected from the court. Acts 18, 12 to 16. Now this view is not of Corinth, Gallio's headquarters. It's Delphi, the home of the famous Oracle of Apollo, and one of the most spectacular settings in Greece. Among the many inscriptions found among the ruins of the sanctuary, there was this one. Though broken, it still preserves a reference to the Roman governor. Here are the letters that are highlighted. Neos Gallio. And here's a translation. Tiberius Claudius Caesar Augustus Germanicus, highest priest, invested with tribunician authority for the twelfth time, acclaimed imperator for the twenty-sixth time, father of the fatherland, consul for the fifth time, censor, all those titles for the Emperor Tiberius, of course. He sends greetings to the city of the Delphians. For a long time I have been well disposed toward the city of Delphi, but now, since it is said to be destitute of citizens, as Lucius Junius Gallio, my friend and proconsul, recently reported to me, and so forth. And if we return to Corinth, to the marketplace, we can see the foundation of the Bema, the platform from which Gallio looked down at Paul, and, like a practical, no-nonsense Roman administrator, threw out the case against him. There was another Corinthian official, this one mentioned in Romans 16, that chapter that is filled with greetings, Erastus, who is the city's director of public works, and our brother Quartus, send you their greetings. If we were to stay in the Corinthian marketplace and just turn our backs on the Bema, we would see this. It's the main road leading down to the two harbors that made Corinth such a bustling trade center. The road was nicely paved and lined with columns whose bases you can still see. And beside the road, still in situ, as the archaeologists say, is this inscription. When we fill out the abbreviations, it reads, Erastus pro idelitate sua pecunia strawit, or if your Latin is a bit rusty, Erastus, for his aedileship, laid this pavement at his own expense. Another name from the Bible turns out to be a real person, a Christian, and a companion of Paul. The last name here calls for some background. First, we read in Acts 15 about the Apostolic Council in Jerusalem to determine what may be required of Gentiles who accept Christ. There we read, the whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the miraculous signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. When they finished, James spoke up, Brothers, listen to me. And it was he who expressed the consensus that Gentiles need not accept Judaism to be accepted in Christ. But he was also among the earliest of the church leaders to be martyred for the faith. Hegesippus tells us how it happened. When he was seized by a mob in the temple, they went up and threw down the just man and said to each other, 
Let us stone James the just. And they began to stone him, for he was not killed by the fall. But he knelt down and said, I entreat thee, Lord God our Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And one of them, who was a fuller, took the club with which he beat out clothes, and struck the just man on the head. And thus he suffered martyrdom. And they buried him on the spot, by the temple. And his monument still remains, by the temple. There is a 13th century mosaic in St. Mark's Cathedral in Venice that portrays this martyrdom. There we see the sequence of events, with the principles labeled in Latin. The Jews look on, as James is hit from behind and falls from the height of the temple. There he lies, wounded but still living. Uh, Jacob, incidentally, is a variant spelling of James. The Pharisees stand there, watching as the fuller strikes him. Pecusus obit. Struck, he dies. And finally, at the lower right, we see him sepelitur, laid to rest. And now we come to the most important and controversial inscription we will see today, the one on the so-called James ossuary. That's James the Just, brother of Jesus, leader of the early church, and martyr for his faith. This ossuary was a major item in a seven-year trial in an Israeli court. Numerous experts had judged the inscription to be authentic, one of them memorably saying, If this is a forgery, I quit. But the Israel Antiquities Authority said it was just that. It is tempting to think that the IAA were so determined to have this artifact seen as a fake because of its stunning relevance to Christian history and to the authenticity of the Christian faith. In any event, after seven years of testimony in which the preponderance of experts argued in favor of the inscription and the IAA produced little evidence to the contrary, the judge ruled that there is no evidence that any of the major artifacts were forged, and the prosecution failed to prove their accusations beyond a reasonable doubt. Oh, what did the inscription on the James ossuary say? Here it is. Yaakov, James. Bar, son of. Yosef, Joseph. Achiv, brother of, Yeshua, Jesus. And so it appears that we have here the burial chest of James, the brother of our Lord. And some folk have no interest in archaeology. Go figure. If you have questions about this lecture, or any of the others in the Good Answers series, you may direct them to me, Dr. Jerry C. Four, at yahoo.com.